Today, a New York judge ruled that Donald Trump and his company must pay more than $450 million, including interest. A huge penalty for his company's years-long pattern of fraud. And remember, in addition to that truly staggering amount of money, Donald Trump still has to pay a small army of lawyers who are defending him in four criminal cases, one of which officially goes to trial next month on March 25th, right in the middle of presidential primary season. Back with me are my friends and colleagues, Rachel Maddow and Lawrence O'Donnell. Thank you for sticking around, guys. Um, Rachel, I, I, I think there's something really important in, in Judge and Goron's ruling that I'd love to get your thoughts on. Um, it's the notion that he's making this decision, not particularly out of, you know, seeking, obviously he's punishing the Trump organization and their fraudulent uh, practices, but it, he's doing it in, in service of a common good. And I'll, I'll just read what he wrote. The court is not constituted to judge morality. It is constituted to find facts and apply the law. In this particular case, in applying the law to the facts, the court intends to protect the integrity of the financial marketplace and thus the public as a whole. That idea that this is not, it's, yeah, it's about New York and Wall Street, but really it's about the public good. I wonder if you think that has resonance politically, that that notion, whether hmm. or not that is something that resonates with an American public that might, in some cases, look at this and say, wow, that's a lot of money for him to pay for a crime for, for, whom there, for which there is no apparent victim. Right. And that's what Trump and his, indeed, his defense counsel, even yeah. in responding to the ruling today, are banking on is this idea that, oh, Deutsche Bank is fine. Like, <laughs> Deutsche Bank is fine. Yes, they didn't get paid many, 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 many millions of dollars. They would have been paid had this fraud not been perpetrated on them, but they don't mind, so the fraud's okay. I mean, it's a um, kind of a really cynical, real politic approach that they're trying to take both in the public relations efforts that they're making around this, but also in the courtroom. And, I mean, Judge, Judge Ngoran today just spelled that out in very blunt terms over and over again throughout the ruling, making clear that it's not flying in the courtroom. I think they are still hoping that it would fly uh, in terms of the way the public perceives this. But, you know, Alex, you made a really good point at the top of the show. I mean, this is, you know, Trump's uh, Trump University, which wasn't a university, has been shut down as a as a fraud. Trump's foundation wasn't really functioning as a charity, has been shut down as a fraud. Trump's business has been criminally convicted of fraud. Trump has been found liable personally for sexual assault. Trump and his business now have been found liable civilly for having perpetrated a multi-hundreds multi of millions of dollar fraud on the people of New York and on the people who all use the same market to, to, to engage in both financial and real estate transactions. And if you can explain one of those away with a kind of cynical real estate specific argument, you know, I guess more power to you. But ultimately, these do, these things do start to seem like a pattern. <laughs> and Trump not being trusted legally to run his own company business for three years is a bad predicate to take to the American people for please let me run the free world for four more plus. Right. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the idea that he could run all these businesses, therefore, what was the, how hard was it going to be to run the American government? I mean, that has been, that sort of myth-making has been destroyed, Lawrence. But I do wonder, you know, in terms of which, it, what, what MAGA has become, you know, at the outset of Donald Trump's political uh, career, it was very much built on the sort of the, the notion that he was a tycoon and mm -hmm. that was, you know, that was the, the important part of his resume that you needed to pay attention to. I do wonder, though, whether the, grieve, the, the grievance and the rage of MAGA has eclipsed the sort of aspirational, um, you know, uh, mo monopoly man quality that, that made Trump so attractive to Republicans. Well, I mean, downside. you know, if you're a mega Republican voter, nothing can shake you from Donald Trump and nothing in, right. the, in a courtroom can shake you from Donald Trump, including, including, by the way, his very first promise to them as a candidate, his very first promise was, I'm very rich. I don't need anyone's money to run for president. He paused about a week, and then has never spent another day of his life not asking those people for president. And we had them on MSNBC in Iowa with microphones in front of those voters, and they're saying, yeah, I'm voting for Trump because you can't buy him because he doesn't need any campaign contributions. The next week, yeah. 
some of those people were sending him campaign contributions. So, so that is an unshakable bond uh, that is so deeply perverse, we'll, we'll never un unwind it. Uh, but, you know, Trump University was uh, basically uh, civilly prosecuted by the New York Attorney General during Donald Trump's first presidential campaign. And he was promising his voters, I will never settle, I never settle, I'm too tough to settle. And then he settled uh, for $25 million. They watched that. They voted for him. Uh, here he is now getting hit with uh, 20 times that, yeah. you know, in, in one day uh, through the same office go going after him in, in, in court. And so, you know, they, they are unshakable. The, the question is, you know, what does it mean at that margin that decides the Electoral College in Michigan and Pennsylvania, Arizona, places like that? And all you can bet on is that it doesn't help at the margin. Yeah, I, I do wonder, um, Rachel, how you think this impacts kind of the calculations that are being made right now in terms of Donald Trump as the likely nominee for the Republican Party, right? I mean, as Lawrence outlined mm -hmm. in the last segment, I think th this ruling to some degree was expected given that uh, Judge Ungoran found the Trump Organization civilly liable for fraud at the outset of it. Um, the number is big, but it is the number kind of in that ballpark that had been bandied about. I mean, do you think it has a meaningful impact on someone like, say, oh, Nikki Haley, who seems to largely be in this race hedging against Donald Trump's, you know, criminal or, you know, legal exposure and potentially betting that maybe he doesn't make it to November? I mean, I think that Nikki Haley kind of owes it to the campaign that she's run thus far to stay in no matter what happens, because who knows what's going to happen with Trump. I mean, it costs money to run a campaign, but in terms of her, like, reclaiming her place in the party, that ship has sailed. The only reason for her to stay in is if Trump gets raptured, effectively. Um, but, but I think the, the, the more important thing here for us as a country is what's going to happen to the whole Republican Party, the whole infrastructure of the RNC, and everybody who mobilizes to elect a Republican president in an election year when Donald Trump is going to be waging war on the rule of law as part of his campaign, as the central point of his campaign. I mean, with, with the $100 million on the, around the Jean Carroll stuff, E. Jean Carroll stuff, with the $450 million around this stuff, with the four criminal trials still to come, the whole point of his campaign is going to be that the court system and the legal system and judges and court rulings are terrible, and we got to get rid of those things. Is the RNC... Are all the donors, is every Republican member of Congress going to join him in that, in trying to destroy the idea of the rule of law in America and the idea that judges' rulings are things that we should cover, not, that, we should, that we should follow, and that court orders are things that are mandatory, that we must follow because we believe in the rule of law? Are the Republicans everywhere who have enabled him also going to enable him now when he comes after the next prosecutors and the next judges and the next jurors and the next witnesses and the next court clerks and the next freaking bailiffs or whoever else is involved yeah. in the court, next courtroom drama he's involved in, are all the Republicans going to line up and waging war on that branch of government too? That is the central question for the future of the country, regardless of how the election turns out. Yeah, it's such a great point because it's going to be an unceasing stretch of courtroom trials, presumably until November. Mm -hmm. Up until this point, Lawrence, um, Trump has tried to invoke Biden mm -hmm. as the enemy behind all of this. Mm -hmm. But I think Rachel rightly points out it's not, you know, Biden's not pulling the strings here. This is the American justice system. And you can run a campaign against Joe Biden, but can you run one against the American justice system? Well, you know, the whole, the, the whole Trump operation runs on uh, an audience who, is in who are incapable of separating fact from fiction. So he can give them any fiction he wants, and they will accept it. Uh, and, and then the elected officials, the Republican elected officials, live not so much in fear of Trump, but they are desperately in fear of those voters who are congregated in their districts who worship Donald Trump. And that's the trap uh, that they are in, and they are all thoroughly to the bone, cowardly about that and unwilling with the, you know, rare exceptions like Liz Cheney, who pop out, you know, uh, to uh, in any way stand up against that. And so the to the question that Rachel just asked, I wish I could come up with a positive answer to it, but um, uh, I, I'm out of it. I don't I don't see how to do that.
Well, all I can say optimistically is we will see what happens. Um, Lawrence, I hear that you are going to be hosting it's the a, 10 it's p.m. A, it's show. A, it's a working Friday night. Wow. I'm going to go over to the other studio. First 10, the 9 p.m. show, then the 10 p.m. Yeah. show. Let's do this all the time on any Listen, other night of the week. Any day you want. <laughs> a standing invitation. You know how, um, to, you please, know how to reach me. <laughs> please, please come back, she said. She said with prayed, clasped hands. Um, have a wonderful show, Lawrence. Rachel Maddow, thank you for spending part of your Friday night with us. We appreciate you. Indeed. Thanks for having me, Alex.